Thanks, folks. Just grab a seat. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here we go. If you want to uh, get hold of your Bibles, and we're going to be reading from 1 John. 1 John, so grab, a, grab your phone if it's in there, or grab a hard copy if you've got one of those. We're, we're reading from 1 John. We're in chapter 2. In chapter 2, and we're beginning from verse 18, and we're going to go all the way through to chapter 3. Uh, verse 10. Just before I do that though, uh, a lot of you here know Steve Bentley and Steve's uh, mother uh, passed away just in the last couple of days or so too. So we stand with you Steve at uh, this uh, really tricky time, mate. We pray. Please be praying uh, for Steve as they uh, approach a time of a funeral and saying uh, farewell. Uh, his mother was saved and was ready to go home too. So that's the wonderful news uh, that comes uh, with that. Why don't we read together this um, Word of God, which is uh, God's chance to speak to us this morning through His Word. And as I say, 1 John chapter 2, and we're beginning at verse 18. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that, that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the lie but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you. I should look at you when I say that, not down. Uh, and also to those of you who are joining us online. Um, welcome again. If I haven't met you, uh, I have the joy and privilege uh, of serving as the lead pastor at Canterbury Gardens. Um, we as a church, if you're visiting, we've been going or just started going through the book of 1 John. Uh, and last week, um, Paul, not the apostle, but Paul who serves here, did, I love saying that every time he preaches actually, um, did an excellent job last week. <laughs> Um, he got us to consider a really um, fundamental truth in the Christian faith, uh, the truth of abiding in Christ. He got us to consider what that means and how that impacts our daily walk, uh, how we need to consider how we love one another because of this truth, and then finally, getting us to really kind of do a bit of a stock take of our lives and what that implications of that is, and then challenging us as we head into the week we've just had. Uh, this morning, uh, the passage that was just read to you, the true word of God, I pray has already been stirring you through his spirit, and this is what I hope for us to consider, which is living as children of God, living as children of God. With that in mind, would you join with me in prayer? Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and as you know already, the hearts and minds and wills of everyone here would you challenge, refresh, stir, encourage? May we gaze at the beauty of who Jesus is and may we be confronted with the beauty and truth of what that means in our lives. Please protect us from the evil one, uh, both his accusations and his lies and distractions. Jesus, please, you alone be glorified. May we walk away knowing you more. In Jesus' name, amen. So have a look with me again. We're going to sort of read some passages again. So have a look again in verse 18. Children, it is the last hour, as you've heard, that the Antichrist is coming. So many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. In this moment, John is describing two types of people. We've got the Antichrist and Antichrists. Now, if you have grown up in church circles, this is the moment where this may stir many kind of things already, and perhaps even now you're starting to go, ooh, I heard that word Antichrist, where's this going to go? Now, before we head too far... What John is trying to do, he's already explained to us in the earlier chapters, right, why he's writing to these Christians that he deeply loves. Remember in chapter 2? I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. Now, it's a wonderful reminder to you and I to understand what it means not to sin. It actually comes from remembering who we are if we are children of God. Because has that truth impacts our heart, it actually impacts how we live in all areas of our lives. In this moment, he says, children. Did you hear that again? You'll see this all through John in his writings. It's one of his favorite words that he keeps on repeating. He says it's the last hour. Now, earlier, just in the few verses that we unpacked last week, he had already said in verse 17 that the world is passing away. And part of that sign of the world passing away is to understand there will be coming of an Antichrist and also the reality of many Antichrists. Now, I personally think this is twofold here in this particular passage. There is a person that I think John is alluding to and uh, speaking of for the people at that time and also pointing perhaps to a head, but also he speaks of Antichrists, plural. Now, like I said, if you've grown up in Christian circles, this is the moment. You're already thinking about various things. Aha, this is the moment. Maybe Shabu's going to unveil for us who the Antichrist is. I am going to disappoint you today. See, in history, the reality has many have tried. There's some pictures up here on the screen for you. This hopefully will not make you stumble. Right? 
For the New Testament church in that time, for them, the Antichrist, as they always lived as though Jesus was going to return any time, was the emperor of Rome at the time. For others in church history, and particularly in the era of the Reformation, they believed that the Pope was the Antichrist. In modern day history, there were people like Hitler, as churches described that he was like the Antichrist kind of type person. When I was growing up, this is back in the 90s, shows my age, apparently Mikhail Gorbachev was probably going to be an antichrist because of that birthmark on his head. The birthmark meant to be the sign. Anyway, keep going. There's, in more modern history, there's Obama. And you probably have many theories on who it might be. I'm sure you've seen those YouTube videos and have been sent to those YouTube videos like I have. Now, you can take those pictures of the screen, thank you. Now, whatever your theories might be, please don't lose sight on what John is trying to get us to focus on. Uh, This particular term of Antichrist uh, is actually in the New Testament about four or perhaps five times. It's actually only in John's letters. He's not as much focused on the who, but he's more focused on what they produce. Uh, Do you remember the the theme that he's been already unpacking for us about abiding, or some translations might say remain, the focus is how your life, how you live your life, reflects who you believe in. And what he's doing in this moment is giving us a picture of contrast. Whether if it's the Antichrist or whether it's Antichrists, they will ultimately display this truth. They are not abiding or remaining in Jesus Christ. So, this reminder is here. It's a moment where he says, have a look at him again in verse 19. He says, there is an antichrist or antichrist. There are going to be many antichrists that will come. But where did these antichrists come from? Did you see that in the verses in front of you? They went out from us. But the key, they were not of us. Why? For if they had been of us, they would have continued or remained, in other words, they would have shown that they are actually God's children. They would have remained with them as followers of Christ. Uh, The thing that often strikes me in Scripture, it's in this moment, I think as followers of Jesus even today, perhaps you and I might automatically think the threat is out there. Uh, Scripture always reveals to us Be careful. Sometimes the threat is not out there, but it's within here, within the community of faith. This is the moment when individual or individuals who end up ultimately denying that Jesus is the Christ, what they do is twist and change who Jesus is ultimately to suit culture or ultimately to suit their own personal needs, What they end up doing is discrediting who Jesus is and it's displayed in their ultimate lack for their love for God and their lack of love for each other. And this is why I think in our church world we have many people who have been wounded by, as they say, the church. And if you're like me, some of us might be already going, well, okay, who is this Antichrist? Please remember what John's trying to get at. He's speaking to a church, perhaps they're discouraged, and he wants to encourage them. And there's this loving encouragement that he says to them. Have a look again in verse 20. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. It's a wonderful reminder, right, to the followers of Christ, if you are a child of God, unlike the Antichrists who have been... um, walking around and pretending that they're anointed, they're actually not anointed because this language that's here in front of us is John reminding these Christians, actually, you've been anointed. You've actually been set apart for God's work. And in this context here, it's talking about the very indwelling of the Holy Spirit for every Christian. This language, I think, is John being very deliberate. The issue he's dealing with is is the type of anti-Jesus kind of teaching that ultimately was shown in sort of like in two parts. 
The first thing was they would deny anything that was physical. And ultimately they would say, physical doesn't matter, it's all about spiritual. So what that means is that you can live as you please physically, it won't impact uh, your spiritual life. And that's why John addresses earlier on. We actually saw Jesus, we touched him, we, we held him. And the other half of it is that there's this kind of group that were teaching things like, well, you know, yes, I know you've heard about Jesus, but I've got the special knowledge. I've got this special secret anointing that you don't have. And if you really want to receive this, you must believe what we say. And actually, if you don't have this, you're really missing out. See, what John is doing is encouraging these Christians, as children of God, they haven't missed out on anything. They haven't missed out on anything as children of God. They've been anointed in, in verse 20, it's there, by Jesus himself. They don't need some sort of special, super spiritual kind of person to bring an anointing on them of some kind. They, they have all knowledge. Nothing's been hidden from them. And in this context, it's saying these antichrists who had gone out from them were declaring, actually, you've missed out on the secret. We've got the secret. Come follow us. And John's saying, no, that's not true. That's not right. You've been given all knowledge. They actually know the truth. You see that in verse 21? The truth of the good news of the gospel, the truth of who Jesus is. Unlike the language again, antichrists. They ultimately do not declare truth. See, as children of God, what he's saying is this is what you have. And this means also if you are a follower of Jesus, what, this is what you and I have. This is what is true. It is not a lie. And to kind of give a contrast and to clarify what is true, John wants to show them what is true and what is a lie. He wants to clarify a few things. Have a look with me in verse 22. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. So what he's saying in this moment is uh, um, the anti-Christ kind of people, they bring this kind of message and ultimately what they're doing is denying who Jesus is. And what he's saying is in this moment, he wants to go into a little bit more detail. He says to them, he who denies the Father and the Son. See that in verse 23? No one who denies the Son can't have the Father. So the idea is that as you confess who Christ is and as you confess who the Father is, you can't have one without the other. They're united. And the language of anointed is also the, the Spirit. And so it's this whole Christian language of Trinity, language going on in this passage for us. See, now, perhaps we're sitting in 2023 and going, well, what's the point? See, friends, in this world that we live in, there's no difference in what John and the church was experiencing. See, the reality is there are antichrists that live in today. These are people who will ultimately put themselves against the teaching of Jesus Christ and the very person of Jesus Christ. They are ultimately going to put themselves in that place or they'll twist and turn things for their ultimate personal selfish goal or for their religious um, vigor or direction that they want to lead to. And ultimately what they'll say is that salvation is through this particular means. But what they're doing in that moment is actually denying what Scripture says, what John is saying here in this moment. Ultimately what you're doing is denying the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And in contrast, he encourages this church that he deeply loves, children of God, that's who they are. That the children of God ultimately acknowledge who Christ is. See, it's a good moment for those of us who know Jesus, who are followers of Christ. It's a good reminder for you and I in the moments that you and I have given the privilege to share the things about Jesus. Maybe step back for a moment. We all have what's known I call the theological hobby horses. If you don't have one, 
I'm sure you do. You love talking about it all the time. It comes up to that direction all the time. We love talking about it with our friends and families and workmates, which is fine, but I wonder sometimes as followers of Jesus, do we complicate things too much in getting to the reality of who Jesus is? Uh, you can do any stat study in Australia, secular Christian, secular Aussie. This is someone who has no church background, no church interests. They have no interest in anything to do with the Christian faith. And after, I think sometimes as Christians, what we end up doing is we find we're looking for that secret source to convert someone from not believing in Jesus and believing in Jesus. So we use amazing things, apologetic tools, we may focus on the, uh, um, the importance of Scripture, the power of Scripture. We may, you know, a whole sort of science and God thing. Uh, we may even love, because the Antichrist is here, we want to talk about end times. Whatever it might be. But I wonder sometimes what we miss is these people who do not know who Jesus is ultimately have been deceived by the message of the evil one. And perhaps as followers of Jesus, what we need to spend more time about is actually talking about Jesus himself rather than our hobby horse. There's nothing wrong with apologetics. You should use that if you wish. But I wonder if we need to grow more in talking about who Jesus is and what he's done to those who do not believe in Jesus. Because ultimately, whatever they, their questions are, which are wonderful, at some point, they must be confronted by who Jesus is. They will need to be confronted by Jesus. And that's that famous question, who do you say that I am? Everyone will have to answer that. Followers of Christ, we are children of God. This description here is little children. This is enduring, loving, fatherly language, perhaps an invitation for us in the midst of our study, in the midst of research, all those wonderful things that we have access to, may you and I never lose sight or even tire or tire of the beauty and wonder and majesty of Jesus Christ. And I think this is why he reminds them in verse 24 again, this wonderful truth that has been coming over and over again. Let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you. This language that John loves to use of abiding or remaining, it's repeated all through his letters. And the reason why is also he tells them, remain in him because something is awaiting. There's a promise awaiting you that is eternal life. Now, this language that John uses in 24 to 25 is nothing new. He's actually literally heard Jesus speak of it. If you remember in Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 4, it's up here on the screen. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. See, as children of God, as they, as we abide or remain in Jesus, fruit will happen through the Spirit. Because if we're not connected or abiding or remaining in Jesus, we cannot produce fruit. But then there's also this wonderful promise as we abide and remain in Jesus, as we walk day by day along with Jesus, He leads us. There's this wonderful promise of what is not just waiting ahead of us, the truth of eternal life, but also what we have now. See, in this particular passage here, John is telling this church, which is consistent all throughout John's writings, that the eternal life a believer has is not just when we die, but we actually have it now. It's a wonderful gift that Christ has given. It's wonderful because to those who are the kind of anti-Christ types, they're ultimately saying, actually, there's more, there's more, there's more. What he's saying is, for those who are children of God, Jesus has made this possible, and you have eternal life. Not just when you die, but you have eternal life as soon as you give your life to Jesus in faith. It is yours now. Fellow like children of God, do we live, or do we remain, or do we abide in such a way if this is true in our lives? Because if this is true, that we have eternal life now in our hearts, 
it reshapes everything in our lives. It reshapes your marriage, it reshapes your single life, it reshapes your finances, it reshapes everything because of the eternal life that you have now. And I wonder if we don't fully comprehend this, as it says in verse 27, have a look again. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just it has taught you, abide in him. See, they had people coming in and saying to them, I have some new teaching for you. It's much better than what you've heard. It's new. It's much more flashier. You should have a listen to it. I should show you my wonderful video that I've created for it. No, he reminds them, actually, you're not missing out on anything. You haven't missed out. John says, don't be deceived in verse 27. The Spirit is already in you. Christ himself has anointed you. You don't need some sort of special spiritual guru that keeps on saying, I have better teaching for you. Because ultimately what they're going to do is proclaim an anti-Christ message, which ultimately will always often be about themselves, and or they will deny Christ or add to Christ or add to his gospel. And ultimately those people often feel they're not spiritual enough. Have you ever heard that in our day and time? That you're not spiritual enough. You've missed out on something. You need something new. But the truth of what Scripture says is, for the child of God, the Spirit remains on us, and He, that is the Spirit, will teach us the things of Christ. John's repeating literally what he already heard Jesus say, like in John 14, verse 26. It's up here on the screen. But the Helper and the the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. What does that mean for you and I today? Perhaps something to consider. In a season of history, you and I have so much access to so much information and so many things that are new, including things that proclaim you've missed out on the secret teachings of Jesus, you need to hear this. You and I can Google, we can YouTube, we can use apps, we can podcast over and over again you've got audio bibles you've even got an uh, audio uh, books you've got audio bibles with various different accents now please hear me there's nothing wrong with those tools right if they stir your affections for jesus they're wonderful things but it's a wonderful reminder to you and i that you and i need to come back to this wonderful powerful truth that is led by the spirit to remind of who Jesus is? Or do you and I attempt to think that there's always something more and that we've missed out? Do you know, this is nothing new. It actually began in the garden. Since the beginning of time, enemy, the enemy, Satan himself, has always tempted, desires to have the, not only the physical eyes, but the very eyes of our hearts to be captured by something or someone else. Other than our Heavenly Father. See, as children, perhaps today is to return to the truth, to come and remain and abide in Jesus, the one who, the Holy Spirit, he will always talk about Jesus and point us to Jesus. And as children of God, we wait, as it says in verse 28, for us. And now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. So there's this promise again of Jesus returning. And the idea is that as children, we don't need to shrink away because we are adopted, we are his children. And but also that there is fruit in our lives. It's ultimately shaped by who he is, the righteous one. He empowers us through the spirit to have a life that practices righteousness. In other words, children of God, our lives display who ultimately we belong to. Our lives display 
whose children we are. That's what this is pointing us to. So how we live matters. How we live in our flesh matters. It actually matters every day because it displays who we are, whose children we are. Remember who John is writing to, right? The, the children of God. He's repeating this term over and over again. If you have a pen, highlight it, circle it. This is what it means if you're a follower of Christ. This is the very engine room if you're a follower of Christ. This is the very engine room and motivation of why we live a particular way. Why we say no to things and what we say yes to. It's by Jesus, for Jesus, by the power of his spirit displayed ultimately for our love for God and, and you will see in John, our love for each other. So as you read again in chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, let me read these words to you and see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children. Now and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Dear friends, I would encourage you at some time this week to set aside time to just sit and read those words over and over again and let it wash over your heart. See, the world that we live in will not see us ultimately as how God sees us, and that's what matters, because they don't know him, yet God knows us as his children, not when he returns, but now as his children. See, when Christ does appear, we will actually see the physically resurrected Christ, And our own physical bodies will become like Jesus' physical resurrected body. If you want to know what that is actually going to look like, have a read the end of the Gospels. It's a beautiful, powerful picture. I'm hoping I'll be 21 and fit again. I don't know. But the whole point is, it's a language of, like in the beginning, our bodies, physical bodies, will be like as it was meant to be with our Saviour, just as He is. And this is our hope, right? This is the reason, as Christians, this is our hope that we cling on to, because as children, Christ is making us pure daily, and we will be presented pure because of His work. You and I live in a moment in history, right? Right? We're being told over and over again, if you haven't picked it, you will see it in most of the cartoons that even kids have, that you can decide who you are. You decide. Actually, you can redesign yourself to be who you want to be. That's not what Scripture gives us. It gives us a much glorious, beautiful, true picture. Friends, if you're someone who's exploring the Christian faith, I want you to know... You will never be fully whole and fully loved till you come confronted with the one who truly will show true love in himself, through himself, through Jesus Christ. And it's not till you're a child of his you'll see that. Followers of Christ, we are followers, but we're also children. Do you know what awaits you and I? This past week, I had the great privilege to meet with this person. I meet with him every maybe two months. He's been in ministry for many years. I sat with him, and he's in his late 70s, and I sat with him and said, how are you today? I won't say his name. And he looked at me and said, "Um, today. And looked out, sort of, we were at a cafe, looked out the window and said, I'm breaking. And I said, okay, what does that mean? Then he looked at me and said, Well, when you get to my age, there's always something breaking. But then he looked at me and said, but Shabu, I'm getting closer to heaven. And he has this glint in his eyes, the smile on his face. He wasn't looking down and he said to me, and you know what, Shabu, every day I'm learning how much more Jesus loves me. And I looked at him and I remember thinking as I drove home, going, oh Lord, please let me be that person when I'm that age. 
See, as we grow in this truth, it motivates us by the power of the Spirit to live and practice our lives as children of God, to love Him, and then ultimately then display it in how we love one another. And then we're given this contrast, right? John says, have a look again in verses 4, to four, uh, four onwards. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practice lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know what, that He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. But whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he was born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God, who are the children of the devil, who does not practice righteousness, is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother or sister. In this moment in the section here, he gives two contrasts. There's two types of kids, two types of children. There are those who are of the devil, and then there are those who are of God. And the key is the way that they live their lives. The practices is the language. Those who are of the devil make practice. Uh, the language is the person who is, has this ongoing, deliberate lifestyle of denying Christ and who he is and his commands. While those who are children of God, as they remain in Christ, they can't keep sinning. The Spirit of God won't allow them to do that. So they keep turning to Christ because they know that's their only hope. The only security and joy because they are children of God. A, a kind of a picture way of doing this is up here on the screen for you, if you have a quick look for you. If you can imagine for a moment in that access, right? This is from Robert Thume. He's written a book called uh, Gospel Centered Life. I'd encourage you, if you're a follower of Jesus, to grab that book. It's a great devotional. There are those who give their life to Christ in that moment. On one axis, there's a growing awareness of God's holiness. On the below, growing awareness of my flesh and sinfulness. What's the whole point of that? Well, there are people who give their life to Christ and they see how amazing God's grace is, but what happens is it's like they've got their ticket to heaven and that's it. What happens is Jesus and his gospel and his beauty and the sacrifice of Jesus sort of just stays the same. The next slide. The invitation is for the child of God is in that moment where they're confronted by God's grace and mercy and truth and they give their life in faith. And what happens is as they see God's holiness, they also see their sinfulness. This is not about beating themselves up. They realize, I am no longer what I used to be. I have a new identity. And what they can only cling to is Jesus Christ and his gospel. And that truth becomes bigger and bigger because they realize how gracious God is to them. They are now a child of God. And there is more wonder of God's grace in their lives. And there is more joy to actually say, actually, it's a good thing for me to say no to sin. It may cost, but it's a good thing. And there is an ever-dependence need for Jesus and his gospel and doesn't leave any room for arrogance or pride. This is the kind of language I think John is trying to get at. He's encouraging these Christians, don't be deceived by these false teachers. They're actually ultimately children of the devil. Their works will not stand. It will be destroyed. What happens is the cross of Christ becomes diminished. But there's this beauty that's given to us in these verses. There's no, like, no hope at all. There is hope that Christ came to get rid and destroy the works of the devil. Amen? See, as children, the call is to practice righteousness. What that means is there's a reason why we live as God has called us to live is not to show off how good we are. No, it's because we're children of God through His Spirit. We desire to live as God has called us to live, and the cross becomes bigger, and that's a good thing. The heart of this, in this language of law in this passage, it's law language that they should know of in the uh, in the Bible, it's actually revealing what was the law f- was there for. It was to reveal the need for atonement, the re- need for propitiation, the need for a sacrifice. Then jo- John says, actually, 
Christ has actually fulfilled this, and this is a good thing, and then he is actually kind of reworking or redoing these words that Jesus already said. Remember these words of Jesus in John 13? I give you a new commandment to love one another just as I have loved you. You also to love one another. Everyone will know by this that you are my disciples if you love, if you have a love for one another. Jesus says, this is how you live as a child of God. See, to practice righteousness is more than the do's and don'ts of the Christian life. There are things that you do and things that you don't. But it is ultimately displayed in the way that we love one another. That's the mark of a child of God. See, the false teachers of the time were trying to get people to withdraw away from the Christian community and ultimately telling them, don't love those Christians. They don't really know what they're talking about. See, as I said to you, the threat to every Christian community is not often out there. It's perhaps even right here. And this actually truth shaped John's life all throughout history. There's wonderful writings by church fathers about his last words before he passed away. Because he saw what Jesus' life was like. He saw it lived out. And this is why he recorded words like, people will know that we are children of God by how? By our love for one another. Friends, we know that the Christian community is definitely not perfect. Amen? That was very quickly. But we are broken people. The Christian community are broken people. It is actually, a, in many ways, a hospital ward. It's not a cruise ship. And I know perhaps even in our midst here, there are those of you, perhaps even today, are harboring resentment, anger, hurt, because you have been hurt by the church, whatever that looks like for you. What you were experienced was actually not Christian love. It was probably religious pride and arrogance. And I wish I could tell you it will never happen again. But perhaps my invitation for you is to not look to the people as much, but to look to the one who is Jesus, who is the head of the church. Follower of Christ, you are children of God. Uh, to those of us in our midst who are ever exhausted, weary, tired, and following Jesus. I want to remind you again, Christ has made you a child of God. He's anointed you with the Holy Spirit and has given you eternal life. To the, I'm not smart enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not, I wish I had that kind of theological background like that person, can I invite you and I to look away from ourselves and to look to Jesus, the one who has anointed you and given you eternal life, has given you knowledge through his spirit, through his word. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in you, Christian. To the studier, theological book reader, podcast loving sharer, that's me, has has the truth of who Jesus is replaced, has been replaced by the things that you're reading and listening to? Maybe the invitation to you and I is to spend more time considering who Christ is and what he's done. And I say this to you now, what I'm about to say, as one of the leaders and pastors at this church who love you deeply. To my dear, bitter, resentful follower of Jesus. If you are harboring any kind of hurt and pain, which should be acknowledged, should be taken to the cross, but if it's driving you to even more bitterness or anger, particularly towards a fellow child of God, what Jesus says is not what a calling is, but he actually commands you and I to confess it perhaps today. Because I'm just telling you now that bitterness and resentment will eat your soul up if it hasn't already. Come to your Savior and he will give you rest. 
Bring your hurt and pain, and he will bring joy to you through the Spirit. He wants to free you from it. Children of God, this is who you are. Followers of Christ, this is what Christ has made possible. So the invitation is through the Spirit to come and abide in him as his children, because he's indeed the living hope. So as the music team comes to lead us in this last song, I've got some things for us to consider. Firstly, what is or who is currently hindering us from living as children of God? What is it for you? What is it for me? Secondly, is there any sense of resentment or anger towards a fellow brother or sister in Christ? The pastoral team would love to pray with you and encourage you what that would look like to bring reconciliation for the glory of God. To those of you who have been wounded by any kind of church experience or background, we pray that you would find joy and peace and healing in your risen Saviour. Come and rest in him again. And I know in our day and age there are those of us who are questioning the very Christian faith. Perhaps you've grown up in it and you know all the answers and you're questioning it. We're so glad that you're questioning it. Jesus can handle your questions. He loves doubters. He wants to engage with them. But can I invite you to move away less focusing on Christianity and more focus again on Jesus and his life? Because that's where you will truly find true answers in his death and his resurrection and the promise of his return. Gracious God, we come to you, Lord Jesus, our only hope. We thank you for the wonderful privilege to be called your children. And as we sing this last song, minister to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.